Good afternoon to you. Uh, today's topic is World War II. And before I start on this, I just want to say thank you to those of you who took the time to listen to a couple of Woody Guthrie songs and tell me what you think. Uh, he's a personal favorite of mine. Um, probably one of the most influential musicians ever, right up there with the Beatles and anybody else you can think of, Elvis even. But that was last week. Uh, this week, once again, World War II is what we're talking about, and this is one of my personal favorite topics to speak on both in world history and U.S. history. Now, we often forget that the United States is part of the world, and we have to have just a really, really short world history understanding. Um, and a lot of World War II revolves around the idea of fascism. And this guy right here, Benito Mussolini, is the one who invents the idea of fascism. Now, what was slash what is fascism? Well, it's really, really hard to understand, actually. And that's because there's no real concrete definition. Fascism works within the existing government. It works within the existing businesses. It works within the existing army. Fascism comes to power completely legally. Fascism is not a takeover of the government. It is a legal creation, if you will. And Benito Mussolini himself, the inventor of fascism, has trouble defining it. Uh, there is a reading that I give to my world history courses called What is Fascism by Benito Mussolini. And he basically says it's everything and nothing all at once. A very famous Mussolini quote is nothing above the state, outside the state, or against the state. Well, what does all this mean? Fascism is hyper-national, it is hyper-militaristic, and it is almost the exact opposite to what communism is. Another question students have very often is why does it start in Italy? Well, for lack of better explanation, Italy is completely cheated. Italy is screwed in World War I. Before World War I, Italy was best friends with Germany. And at the last minute, Britain and France promised Italy all of this territory if they would switch sides. Italy does switch sides. And when the treaty ends, when the treaty, or when the war ends and the Treaty of Versailles is negotiated, Italy gets almost nothing they promised. Italy gave a lot of lives and sacrificed a lot of men for the war. And Italy felt cheated there as well when the war was over. They felt like their, their sacrifices were in vain. Also, the Italian economy was pretty rough. Italy had only been a country for about 50 years when World War I starts. Italy hadn't quite gelled together and operated as one yet. And the Italian economy after World War I ends is going to completely collapse. Well, when Mussolini comes into power in October of 1922, he does so basically with a popular uprising. Uh, this militant popular uprising, there's these huge fears of communism, and Mussolini basically manufactures a crisis, and the king of Italy makes him the prime minister. Then in the election of 1924, there's a little bit of funny business in the election, and before you know it, the fascist party has the majority of the government. It's another guy you may recognize. This is Adolf Hitler. Nazism is a type of fascism. And Nazism is just as hard to define as fascism as a result. For example, Nazism, it works within the government. It came to power completely legally. Technically, everything Adolf Hitler did was legal according to the German constitution. Uh, the biggest difference between Nazism and fascism though is the racial aspect. Nazism is based on racial superiority, this hatred of Jews, anti-Semitism, if you will. And that's all based on this lie that the Jewish people sold out Germany in World War I and caused Germany to lose the battle. 
Now, just like I answered with Italy, I'm going to answer the same question with Germany. Why Germany? Well, number one, there's the, the big lie that happened after World War I. The German people were not told that their army was on the verge of collapse. The government kept telling the people of Germany, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. And when Germany lost, it was a huge surprise to everybody, and they had to find somebody to blame. And the Jewish population were the ones blamed. Another reason is that Germans had no experience with and had no desire for a constitutional style republic. The majority of Germans liked their emperor and when he was forced to abdicate his throne in 1918, it upset a lot of people. The resulting Weimar Republic was very weak and very unliked at first. In fact, in the Weimar Constitution, there's what's called Article 48, which basically said in times of emergency, the country could be ruled like a dictatorship. And then you have the German economy collapsing when Germany tries to make its first payment towards World War I reparations, the German economy collapses, the money becomes worthless. There are pictures available that show people rushing to the store with wheelbarrows full of money. And by the time they get to the store, it's not worth anything anymore. And the German money gets so devalued that people start burning it to keep warm rather than spending it. And then there's this hatred of the Treaty of Versailles. The German people felt like they were being unfairly picked on. The German people felt like they were being blamed for the start of the war when they said, hey, it wasn't us, it was Austria and Serbia. And the Nazi party were the ones that said, we will undo the Treaty of Versailles. And people agreed. And by the way, the majority of Nazi supporters were under the age of 30. Now, what about Adolf Hitler himself? He's a big name. A lot of people don't know as much about them as they probably should. Um, World War II was not Hitler's first rodeo. In World War I, Hitler served in the German army. Uh, he was actually injured during the war. After the war was over, uh, he gets involved with this very small party called the National Socialists, or the Nazi Party. And by the time we get to 1923, just you know, five or six years after the war's over, Hitler and the Nazi party are already trying to overthrow the government of Germany. There's an event called the Beer Hall Putsch, which happens in the city of Munich, where the Nazis march to the city of Munich and try to take over the government, but at the last minute they're stopped. And as a result, Adolf Hitler is thrown in jail. And while he's in jail, he writes Mein Kampf, or My Struggle. And within Mein Kampf, he basically lays out everything he's going to try to do, and he puts the blame for everything on the Jewish people. Now, once Hitler is out of jail, he becomes the leader of the National Socialistic uh, Deutsche Art. Uh, Parte, which are in English the Nationalistic Socialist German Workers Party. And there's a lot of different things in there. Uh, the Nazis were, were uh, not a socialist party in any way, shape, or form. Um, the Nazis, their platform and the Treaty of Versailles unify Germany and Austria, exclude Jews from citizenship and take over the state administration of businesses. Well, how does Hitler actually get into power? Well, by 1932, the Nazis are the number one largest political party in Germany, but they're not a majority. The German system between World War I and World War II was very different than ours today. There were multiple pol political parties there was the centrist party, there were the social democrats, there was the, the, uh, the Catholic party, there was a Bavarian party, Bavarian People's Party. Uh, 
Socialist Party, the Communist Party, many, many different parties. And the German Reichstag, or, or legislature, was based on proportion. So depending on how many votes each party got, determined how many seats in the Reichstag that party received. It's very different than ours. Well, by 1929, a second economic collapse hits Germany. Almost half of the entire German workforce is out of a job. And the German people are basically looking for anybody to save them. And the Nazi party says, if you vote for us, we will give you jobs. In 1933, Hitler is named the Chancellor by President Paul von Hindenburg. And Hindenburg basically says, what's the worst Hitler can do? Well, in March of 1933, the Nazi party secretly sets the Reichstag building on fire, blames it on the communists, and then uses Article 48 to declare a national emergency. When that happens, Hitler is given temporary dictator powers. Now, what were Hitler's policies? Number one, he wanted to increase the size of the German military. He wanted to rearm the German military. He began this huge public works program and unemployment actually drops between 1932 and 1936 from about 6 million people to under 1 million. Now, how did he do this? by increasing military spending. A full three-fourths of the entire German economy in the late 1930s was spent on the military. Another big part of Hitler's policy, of course, is ethnic cleansing, and that starts way before World War II begins. You can actually look September 15, 1935. The Nuremberg Laws are going to take away German citizenship from Jews. It's also going to close certain professions, including being doctors and teachers and lawyers and bankers from Jews. On November 9th of 1938, you have what's called Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. And the Nazi party encourages people to go out in the streets around Germany find Jewish owned businesses, break the windows, break the doors and put them out of business. Also on that night, Jewish synagogues are torn down. Very shortly after Kristallnacht, uh, Jewish people are required to wear yellow stars on their clothes to identify them at all time. It's not until 1941 that the Jewish people begin to be deported and that will eventually lead to what's known as the final solution or the Holocaust. Well, how do we go from all of that to a world war? Well, in March of 1935, Germany is going to renounce the Treaty of Versailles. Later that same year, Italy is going to attack Ethiopia. And then in March of 1936, Germany is going to reoccupy a piece of land called the Rhineland. The Rhineland was the land, the borderland between France and Germany. When we get to 1937, Italy, Germany, and Japan become best friends. It's called the uh, Axis Alliance. And then from 1936 until 1939, Spain has a civil war where the fascist revolutionary Franco is going to overthrow the government in Spain and take over by force. And Germany uses Spain to test out all of its new weapons and to give its soldiers and Air Force pilots practice. 
Finally, in March of 1938, the German Nazi party infiltrates Austria, overthrows the government, and then joins Germany and Austria together in what's known as the Anschluss. And then finally, 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 September of 1938, Germany is given a piece of land called the Sudetenland by Britain and France. Now the Sudetenland, by the way, it did not belong to Britain. It did not belong to France. It was part of a country called Czechoslovakia and Czechoslovakia had no say in the matter. Britain and France just gave Germany somebody else's land. Now here's a map to give you an idea where everything is. Uh, this land right here, if you can see where I'm moving my mouse, that was the Sudetenland, this ring around Czechoslovakia. That's what Germany is given in September of 1938. And then just a couple weeks later, it takes the middle part of Czechoslovakia also. Austria, March 1938, that part of Europe becomes German territory as well. The Rhineland is the land in between the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and the Rhine River. Technically, that was always German land, but after World War I, it was determined that Germany would not be allowed to station any troops or have any government say so in that territory. So World War II is actually going to begin. And what were the causes of World War II? Well, you can really break it down into five things. Nationalism, militarism, imperialism, and alliances. And it really, it, they're the same reasons World War I starts. With nationalism, the winners of World War I were very prideful. The losers of World War I were very hateful. With militarism, the winners of World War I wanted to maintain their military superiority. The losers wanted revenge and to avenge their loss. With imperialism, everybody still needed wealth, everybody still needed resources, and everybody was trying to you know, regain the lost wealth. And then alliances. There's this idea of strength through diplomacy. And it breaks down to Germany, Italy, and Japan on one side, and then Britain, France on the other side. Now the Soviet Union will join that in 1941, and then the United States will enjoy that, will join it in 1941 as well. So those are kind of long-term causes. The immediate cause, the, the spark that sets the explosion, if you will, September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. Um, Britain and France have both made Poland a line in the sand and told the German government, if you invade Poland, then there will be war. So you have the German invasion of Poland, September 1st, 1939. This new form of warf warfare called Blitzkrieg or Lightning War is used. Uh, it's light soldiers move very fast and basically they hit you before you know what happens and the united states when war breaks out the united states is going to allow the sale of weapons now technically weapons can be sold to britain weapons can be sold to france weapons can be sold to germany it's whoever wants to bring them it's called cash and carry if you can get to the united states with cash the united states government will sell you weapons in reality though, very few German sales are done just simply because Germany doesn't have the Navy to get to the United States. By the summer of 1940, Germany has invaded and taken over most of Europe. They've taken control of Poland, Denmark, Norway. They've taken control of Belgium, the Netherlands. Uh, they take control of France even. Really the only people left to fight against the Nazis is Great Britain. And Great Britain 
led by Winston Churchill, is going to ask the United States President, Franklin D. Roosevelt, for help. Now, FDR does not act on it yet, but the idea is in the background. Also in 1940, FDR is going to run for an unprecedented third term and win it. And FDR, he knows what's going to happen. He's seen the writing on the wall. And as soon as FDR becomes president in 1940, he wins the election. Uh, he's going to begin the first peacetime draft in American history. And he's going to start what's called the Land Lease Program. Um, Great Britain runs out of money. And so the United States says, we will lend you this material. We will lend you these ships if you give us leases on land that we can use for military bases. Now, in June of 1941, Germany is going to launch what's called Operation Barbarossa. And Germany is going to stab the Soviet Union in the back and Russia is going to be invaded. And before you know it, the war has spread to North America. Um, North Africa it's going to be spread to the Atlantic Ocean it's going to be spread all over Europe later in 1941 Franklin D Roosevelt and Churchill are going to secretly meet on a battleship off the coast of Canada and it's there that plans for war are drawn up even though FDR says officially the United States is not going to get involved and this becomes known as the Atlantic Charter. The Atlantic Charter are the war plans that are designed and written up on what's going to happen with FDR and Churchill on that battleship off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. Well, the German advance into the Soviet Union, it's going to be stopped at the city of Stalingrad. Uh, the city of Stalingrad, the battle is so fierce that it's from building to building, room to room within those buildings. And the fight for Stalingrad is like five months long. Eventually the Soviet Union will start to push the German army back and the German advance is stopped. What about Japan? Japan in World War II and the United States, they have a big history. Uh, Japan and China are going to go to war in 1937 in a part of China called Manchuria, which is like the northeast part of China. And before you know it, what's this supposed to be this little regional battle becomes a bigger war. And when this, this war happens between the Japanese and the Chinese, the United States tries to step in and stop it. And the first thing that happens after this war breaks out between Japan and China is that the United States stops selling aviation fuel to Japan. And when the United States stops selling aviation fuel to Japan, Japan responds by taking over Northern Indochina, which we know better today as Northern Vietnam and Cambodia, Laos, that area. They're also going to sign a treaty with Germany and Italy at that time because they need a way to get aviation fuel for their airplanes. In response to that, FDR orders the U.S. government to stop selling any metal, chemicals, and machine parts to Japan, thinking that if they can't build and fix their war material, then they can't go to war. Well, Japan just takes the rest of Indochina, the rest of Southeast Asia, and then they have access to rubber and, and materials and anything else they would need. After that, FDR says, you're done. And FDR completely cuts off trade to Japan and says, we're not trading with you anymore. When FDR tells Japan, we're not trading with you anymore, the Prime Minister of Japan, Hideki Tojo, is going to politely ask the United States to reconsider their ban on trade, but then they're also gonna say, hey, if, if you don't start trading with us, uh, we're gonna do something bad to you. And that something bad is the attack on Pearl Harbor. 
Japan is going to bomb Pearl Harbor December 7th, 1941. We used to believe it was without warning, but that has since been disproven. There was some warning, although the warning was short. When the attack on Pearl Harbor happens, it leaves almost 2,500 dead, almost 1,200 wounded. There are 20 or more ships that are damaged. There's something like 10 battleships that are sunk, uh, something like 200 planes destroyed, and another 200 or so that are damaged. And Japan thinks that they have beaten the Navy, the U.S. Navy, in that one shot. In reality, they just kind of make the United States angry. The very next day, December 8, 1941, President FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, will go before Congress. He will ask for a declaration of war, and he will utter the very famous words, yesterday, December 7th, will be a day that will live in infamy. Now, once the United States enters this war officially, they're able to stop the Japanese expansion of territory within six months. Okay, so that's kind of your world history point of view. Now, U.S. specific, what's the most important thing to know for this class? Well, during World War II, the U.S. government establishes four different agencies. There's the War Production Board, which is going to tell private companies what to produce, how to produce it, and then give the private companies the materials needed to produce. You've got the National War Labor Board. Its job is to negotiate any sort of worker employer issues. And its job was to prevent strikes from happening. Basically keep everybody happy and keep everybody working. Then you have the Office of Price Administration. The Office of Price Administration, its job was to monitor prices and to keep prices from going both too high and too low. That way that there's this constant flow of money to help pay for all of the war materials. And then, last but not least, you have the Office of War Mobilization, whose job was kind of act like a brain. The Office of War Mobilization was what coordinated private businesses with the government and then got all of these other agencies to work within the requirements. By the end of 1942, over 33% of the American economy is devoted to war production. That is one third of the entire American economy is devoted to World War II. This war is very expensive, $250 million per day to fight in World War II. It is not FDR's New Deal that ends the Great Depression. It is World War II. Without World War II, there is really no telling how much longer the Depression would have gone on. Eventually, the government is going to establish a fifth agency known as the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Its job was to invent materials and technologies that would help in the war. So the Office of Scientific Research is going to invent improved radios, improved radars. It's going to invent a gene-like material for clothing. It's going to invent um, antibiotics, nonstick pans, you name it. But probably the most important branch of the Office of Scientific Research and Development is the Manhattan Project. And the Manhattan Project was ungodly expensive and it's what created nuclear weapons and the first atomic bomb. What changes in American society are there? Well, there's a lot of mobility. Uh, the war effort needed a lot of employees 
and people moved around the country to go to where those war factories were. People moved in large numbers from the southern United States to both the northern and western parts of the country. And this is going to cause overcrowding in already overcrowded cities. Family structures are going to break down. There are also going to be some issues with race relations out of this as well. Women are going to enter the workforce in huge numbers. Somewhere between six and seven million women go to work during World War One, or I'm sorry, World War Two. But it's not an equal. It's not equal employment, though. For example, women doing the same job as a man standing next to her are going to earn on average about 65% of the pay. Marriage rates are going to go astronomically high during the war period, and so are birth rates and divorce rates. Basically, a soldier going off to war and a woman would get married very quickly. They would do what newlyweds do. Nine months later, a child would be born. When the war was over, the woman and the former soldier would realize, hey, maybe I don't like you as much as I thought, or I only married you because I thought I wasn't going to make it through the war, and they get divorced. Because of so many women going into the workforce and because of so many men going off to war, child truancy was a problem. There was child care for less than 10% of the children. So you had kids not going to school, you had kids running the streets, you have kids getting in trouble, stealing things. So there's this real rise in childhood and juvenile delinquency. There are calls from African Americans for equal rights. Uh, there is an equal rights movement before the, or a civil rights movement, I should say, before the actual civil rights movement that we think of. Um, as early as 1942, African Americans are demanding that the United States meet racism head on here before that we try to fight racism anywhere else. And there's a gentleman named A. Philip Randolph who was the leader of a, uh, a railroad porter union, basically the people that work on the railroads, uh, primarily and predominantly the people who were, <laughs> best way to explain it, like railroad flight attendants, if you will. The people that worked in that job were predominantly African American. And A. Philip Randolph plans a march on Washington, D.C. demanding equality in exchange for helping with the war effort. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's very worried about what this would look like if a strike based on racial overtones were to break out. The world would report it and the United States would look like hypocrites. So FDR is going to ban employment discrimination based on race in the defense industries. That is enough to stop A. Philip Randolph and the, the Porter, the Railroad Porter Union from doing their march. And by the time World War I is over, there are over one million black soldiers who serve in the military and they're um, mostly these black soldiers are going to be like supply soldiers they're not actually put into everyday fighting and I mentioned previously there are race riots there are race riots in Detroit there's race riot in Chicago there's a race riot in Rochester New York and there's also this rise in black union membership because more blacks are being added to the workforce. So World War II is a very strained time for African Americans. There's also a lot of 
racial tension with Japanese Americans because Japanese Americans were seen as the enemy. There's a lot of persecution against Japanese. The Japanese people are called some very unfriendly things. Japanese people were not served in stores and the United States government is going to round up about 120,000 Japanese Americans and put them into concentration camps or prison camps. The worry was that these Japanese Americans may be more loyal to their ancestral homeland versus their adopted homeland. Well, when the story is done and when everybody is researched, there are like five people working for the Japanese government out of that 120,000 population. One of the most famous military regiments in World War II and really in American history was a predominantly Japanese American regiment. The 442nd Gopher Broke Regiment was the most decorated, the most honored regiment in all of American history. This regiment made up of primarily Japanese American soldiers wanted to prove their loyalty to the people of the United States and they end up winning somewhere around 20,000 medals. I know I have here more than 18,000 but the exact number is unknown. I have seen counts as high as 20,000. There are 4,000 plus Purple Hearts, 4,000 plus Bronze Stars, eight presidential citations. There's the Congressional Medal of Honor and 21 individual Medal of Honors as to go along with that. Now, as decorated as the 442nd Regiment was, they could only serve in Europe because the government had a fear that if the regiment served in Japan, they would turn their back against America. Now the war is going to end when the Russian forces begin to force the German army to, re to retreat after the Battle of Stalingrad. On September 3rd, 1943, the United States and Britain, they're going to invade Italy. And then June 6th, 1944 is D-Day, Operation Overlord. Normandy, the coast of France, is invaded. And by May 8th, 1945, Adolf Hitler has committed suicide. The German government has collapsed and... Germany is going to be forced to surrender. In Japan, the two atomic bombs that the Manhattan Project develop and build are used. One bomb hits Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. The Japanese government refuses to surrender, vows to fight on, and then on August 9th, 1945, a second bomb hits Nagasaki. Now Japan is going to surrender about a month later, September 2nd, 1945, and World War II is officially over after the surrender of Japan. Now there are three important diplomatic meetings to know. And these are three meetings where the leaders of the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain all meet. There's the battle, or not the battle, but there's the Conference of Tehran, which happens in 1943. Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin all meet for the first time, and they're discussing what Europe's going to look like after World War I. Two is over. And there are a couple of agreements, but there are some sticking points as well. It's primarily over what's going to happen to Eastern Europe when the war is over. The Soviet Union wants to set up these puppet states that are going to be controlled by the Soviet Union. 
and the Soviet Union sees this as protection from Germany. Second meeting happens in southern Russia, the conference at Yalta in February 1945. At the conference in Yalta, it's agreed that Germany will be partitioned and Germany was originally split into four parts. It's also agreed that the United Nations will be created. It will be like version 2.0 of the League of Nations. And then finally, we have the Potsdam Conference, 18, or 1945, April. And the Potsdam Conference is held in a suburb of the city of Berlin. Berlin was the capital of Germany. Germany was right on the verge of being defeated and a conference is held at Potsdam. Now Potsdam is different than the other two because there are different people. In the middle of the conference, the results of the great, the election in Great Britain are released. Churchill loses his job as prime minister and a guy named Clement Attlee is going to take his place. FDR has recently died and new president Harry Truman is brought in. Joseph Stalin still attends, but he doesn't like Harry Truman and he doesn't trust Clement Attlee, so he doesn't do anything. It's the prime minister of the Soviet Union, a guy named Molotov, who is going to do the talking for the Soviet Union. They talk about Japan. It's decided that Japan will have to unconditionally surrender. It's also decided that the Soviet Union will enter the war against Japan within six months. And they make good with that last minute. I think it's August 2nd when the Soviet Union attacks Japanese forces. Other than those two things, nothing about what Europe will look like is solved at the Conference of Potsdam. So there are these really, really strong disagreements over what the future is going to look like. And it is the aftermath of the Potsdam Conference that leads to what we now know as the Cold War. Now, I tr truly hope that this was not too much information at once. World War II is just a fascinating story. There are so many moving parts to it that I don't think one lecture can really do it justice, but with our schedule this semester, that's really all I can do. Um, I encourage you though, if you want to learn more about World War II, um, find a good book, read a couple articles. Uh, there's plenty of information out there. And if you have any questions or if you want to know more about World War II or even World War I, they're both things that I studied quite a bit and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions for you. Now, this video is probably long enough. We're at almost the 45 minute mark. This might be the longest one of the year. So I'm just going to uh, cut it off here. I could go on and on and on, but you've probably already turned off the video. So um, we'll be back next week, of course, same time, same channel, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.